In this video, we're going to look at the history of the sewing machine and how it changed the world. The sewing machine both liberated women and enslaved them. We will look at the evolution of its powering mechanism from the crank to the treadle, the knee pedal, and the foot pedal. We will also look at how the sewing machine changed industry, created new industries, brought the need for new technologies, and set off a social revolution that changed the culture. The sewing machine was invented before the family car came into being. While the invention of the sewing machine represented the vitality of American inventiveness and Yankee ingenuity, the results of the sewing machine industry thrust the American mercantile economy into the age of industrial capitalism. Long before the sewing machine was invented, clothing had been sewn with needles made from bones or iron. The early thread that was used was animal sinew, which is made from the tendons of animals because it's strong. Women and young girls had become very skilled in hand stitching because making or mending the family's clothing took up a good portion of their daily duties. Mothers taught all sorts of needleworks to their daughters. Most people only had a few changes of wardrobe per person in that day. All the attempts of designing a sewing machine before the first successful one all moved the needle side to side and were powered with a winding handle. In the late 17th and early 18th century, there was a line of men who attempted to make a mechanical sewing machine, trying to replicate the movement of a hand stitching, but most of them failed. Most tailors were men, working by hand. Some of them attempted to create a mechanical sewing machine. Thimener had the first machine that worked. It was operated with a treadle. He had 80 machines and was contracted to sew uniforms for the French army. But other local tailors were afraid it would put them out of work, so they set fire to his factory. He barely escaped with his life. All 80 of his machines were destroyed. Hunt failed to submit his patent properly, or it got lost, so he never got credit for his work, and he died a poor man. Another gave up the pursuit thinking it would put tailors out of work and cause unemployment. For several years, there seemed to be an ongoing competition as to whom would be the first one to make the first fully working sewing machine. There were many attempts, but most of them had problems and did not work effectively. Elias Howe managed better than most inventors with his patented designs, but he couldn't finance manufacturing his machines. He went to England to try to seek financing to no avail. When he returned, he found other Americans like Singer already manufacturing similar models. He sued Singer, claiming that he fr infringed on using his patent. He won his lawsuit and earned royalties, making him a wealthy man. Singer's first sewing machine was clunky and needed constant maintenance to keep it in operation. It was Alan B. Wilson that perfected the sewing machine. His patent worked better than Hunt, Howe, or Singer had done. Matter of fact, he didn't even know those guys. He teamed up with Nathaniel Wheeler, and with Wilson's patents, they had a successful run of selling sewing machines. Wheeler and Wilson's company came in second to Singer after the principal owners passed away. Singer, in 1908, bought the Wheeler and Wilson company. It wasn't until 1854 when Orlando Potter, president of the Grover and Baker Company, called a meeting in New York. All the sewing machine manufacturers and would-be manufacturers to encourage them to pool their various patents so they could all make functioning sewing machines and they would be marketable. What a great idea. Let's just stitch them all together. Singer mastered the mass marketing campaign even to an international market, making his company the biggest American international company of its time.
Singer had an aggressive force of 3,000 salesmen for both domestic and commercial use. Before the sewing machine, most people assumed, men and women, that only men could master complex machines. Well, Singer hired women to demonstrate the machines in store windows and at fairs, and, and Singer even offered classes to teach women how to sew. Women were pictured in advertisements, as well as young girls with toy sewing machines. Singer offered ministers' wives a sewing machine at half price because they knew she would make the machine available in sewing circles. The sewing machine gave women the opportunity to work outside the home. For some, they were employed at home with their sewing machines. By 1831, the first ready-to-wear clothing factory appeared in the United States. The value of American ready-made clothing production increased from $40 million in 1850 to $70 million in 1870. That's just 20 years. Wow, and it almost doubled. When the machine proved capable of sewing through leather, it was gradually adapted to sewing all the phases of shoe production and boots and saddles and harnesses. During the Civil War, by 1863, the mechanized domestic industry was able to clothe the entire army. By 1910, a clothing retail market was available, where the common person could go to shops and buy ready-made clothes off the rack. This also increased the demand for ready-to-wear clothes, so sweatshops sprang up everywhere, which employed mostly new immigrants because it didn't require great skill. Shop owners were popping up, converting a small three-room New York apartment or a basement into sweatshops, employing as many as 30 people in small spaces. These shop owners looked for low-rent locations and paid low wages to these already poor, mostly immigrants. Mostly women were seamstresses and the men were cutters. Even children helped carrying piles of fabric or pulling out basting stitches. This led to unsafe working conditions, which led to women fainting during hot seasons. I'm sure you heard about the fire that broke out in one of the ninth-story sweatshops where 156 workers died, unable to escape due to the doors being locked, and a fire escape that collapsed. These events brought about the unions and safety labor laws. The sewing machine was tied to the growth of mass advertising and new communication methods, transportation, adjustment of labor laws, wages and conditions, and the standard of living. The liberation of women from hours of tedious sewing meant they now had le leisure time to become connected to social, economic, and political causes in their community. With this transition, America entered the age of industrialized capitalism. In the late 1800s, the home economics program began in state colleges, and that became the portals through which women, for the first time, were able to gain significant access to higher education. These programs were targeted to farm wives, working-class women struggling with the increased demands of combining jobs with housekeeping. These classes taught classes in cooking and sewing. By 1900, almost every middle-class home had a sewing machine. Women had proven that they are quite capable to master the sewing machine, as well as other machines like automobiles, VCR, DVD players, and computers. But the sewing machine was the first complex machine where women proved that they're just as mechanically savvy as men. The sewing machine brought the fashion industry, home interior designs, and began the retail store market. It also affected the interior of automobiles once they came on the scene. Because the sewing machine was marketed directly to women, women became consumers, which greatly affected marketing advertising practices. The advertising industry was born. Sewing machines evolved from cranks to treadles, powered with the feet, 
using the feet freed up both hands, which are often needed when sewing. Did you know that it was considered by some to be improper for a woman to use a treadle machine to use her body that way? Oh! The sewing machine and the demand for ready-made clothing brought the need for electricity. Singer electrified his sewing machines. When the machines are powered by electricity, there were knee pedals and then there were foot pedals. Here is a modern day electrical foot pedal. It has two rubber feet at the far end. I will demonstrate it. I'm often in my bare feet when I'm at home. Besides, if I'm going to be sewing for hours at the sewing machine for all day, why would I wear shoes? They would just chafe my feet. You can see that I'm struggling to keep it in one place, especially if I sew at high speeds. A mouse pad has a non-slip underside. It works great to prevent the, the foot pedal from running away from me. I have no trouble sewing with my left foot, so if I ever stub my right foot, right foot and I can't use my right foot or I break my foot, I can still use my left foot. No problem. I was asked to share tips on threading a needle. For your information, my eyesight is not that great, so I have a method where I sort of feel my way through it that works for me. I place my finger behind the needle, which helps me to see the hole better. As soon as I think I have the thread slipped into the hole, I use my right index finger to hold it while I grab the thread with my other hand. When things get bad, I grab a magnifying glass. Can't see the hole. I also have a fourth machine, which is also a vintage model built with all metal parts. I don't buy sewing machines made with plastic parts, especially internal plastic parts. That's why I like the, vin the old vintage machines. My husband and I are working on our almost antique Singer sewing machines to bring them back to working condition. I have two of them. One I purchased for the table as my bedside nightstand for only $40 at a secondhand shop. 
I wanted it for the beautiful table, but I was happy to find that it also housed a vintage Singer sewing machine. I need to restore the table also someday. I have been trying to find the electrical hookups to bring power to the machine. It has all the other parts, including a needle, bobbin, and thread, but the thread is very old. The machine appears to be in good condition. I have been working on cleaning it up. I hope we are able to get it working again. But I am most excited about getting the treadle in operation as it is a symbol of the industrial age, the Victorian period of which I am fond of. To have a machine that needs no electricity to operate would be so cool. It could work silently. I love silence. I just ordered the belt and a few other parts for it. I was hoping to have it done for this video, but discovered it's going to take a lot more work to restore the cabinet than I expected. It has a veneer finish, so I would like to restore it as close to original as possible, in keeping with its unique character and style, and for that time frame. That will have to be a future video. In my research about the sewing machine, I learned that someone in my family ancestry also manufactured sewing machines, but in England. The Bradburys, on my mother's side of the family, the Bradbury Company was the largest producer of sewing machines in England and for a good long while they were the only manufacturers of sewing machines in England. Later they also manufactured baby carriages, mail carts and bicycles. I may have to find me a Bradbury sewing machine to add to my collection of vintage sewing machines. To have a monument of the famous Singer sewing machine that represents the dawn of the industrialized society and a movement that represents women and societal changes of the liberation of women and the machine that changed society, a transitional piece of history preserved in my care is a very cool thing for me. From this bit of history, we have seen the power of women. They put their foot down they put their foot down against child labor. They put their foot down against unsafe working conditions. They put their foot down against unfair wages. They demanded equal rights and the right to vote. George Gilder wrote in his book, Men and Marriage, quote, what happens in the inner realm of women finally shapes what happens on our social surfaces determining the level of happiness, energy, creativity, morality, and solidarity in the nation. These values are primary in any society. When they deteriorate, all the king's horses and all the king's men cannot put them back together again." End quote. As women, we need to take care that our influence is a positive one since we wield so much power. I hope you got something out of this video. If so, give me a thumbs up. Thanks for watching.